Yeah, thank you, Pallav, for, for the introduction and the, so that I can go straight to the business. Um, my business this afternoon is to share with you uh, the initiative on capacity building to the local government authorities uh, in regard to formalizing rural land in Tanzania. And this is, uh, has been, been done by uh, the property and business formulation program, uh, which is known in its Swahili acronym as Mkurabita. So I've been, I, I will be referring to the word Mkurabita, meaning that the property and business formulation program for Tanzania. Um, let's have a bit of background of uh, how has Mkurabita been uh, introduced, uh, being established. Um, Mkurabita is a government institution, a government initiative which was aiming at empowering the poor, empowering the people who are owning land, who are operating businesses in the informal sector. And how do we empower them? We empower them by transforming them from being informal to being formal so that they can be part of the uh, economy which is governed by the rule of the law. Um, uh, how was it established? What, what, what triggered the, the government to, to establish the, the Mkurabita thing? Uh, the decision to, to establish Mkurabita was, uh, was basically done in September 2003. And this was done after the, um, the uh, third phase government uh, president, His Excellency Benjamin William Mkapa, uh, who met uh, the, the known economist of Peru, Hernando de Soto, uh, who explained to him about formalization and uh, what the president decided, uh, he wanted that, that particular knowledge which he received from Hernando de Soto is being imparted to the uh, people of Tanzania. And he called a high-level meeting of all principal leaders in the country who were explained in two days, explaining what is formalization and what are the consequences of running an uh, economy which is, uh, have a huge, huge uh, assets which are informal. And uh, after he was uh, uh, convinced, that the leaders have understood what is formalization, then he declared that we are now establishing the Kurabita thing so that it can run the, uh, tra the transformation process of transforming people who are in the informal sector to the formal sector. And the effectiveness of this program was uh, in say, November 2004, and the target was, was all Tanzanians who were owning land and operating business in the informal sector. Now, how, how was it implemented? What, what the, how, how the implementation was uh, conceived? As I said, uh, the conceiving of the, the, the program was by the help of the, uh, this Hernando de Soto. I talked about him. And uh, the way it was is that uh, it has to be implemented in four phases. And phase one was uh, to undertake a diagnosis. And the diagnosis was uh, being undertaken between November 2004 up to uh, September 2005. And a lot have been uh, seen from, from it. We'll be uh, uh, discussing them in the next slide. And the next uh, phase was uh, reform design. And the reform design started in January 2006 up to uh, May 2008. Uh, while the third one was implementation phase and implementing the reforms which were, were proposed during the second phase. And this was done between July 2008 uh, to date. And we are still implementing. And the fourth one is capital formation and good governance. And we see there capital formation and good governance started in July 2010, again to date. And now you will wonder why you have two, two, two uh, phases uh, running concurrently. The reason is that um, the ultimate goal of the program was to make sure that people own, who own assets can use the assets to make more money, to make more wealth. So that's why it was capital formation. So if you say, let us complete the implementation phase, then after we have completed, we come to the uh, capital formation phase. It means there will be some people who will not test the fruits of the implementation phase. So we say, let them test while we, we, we move. We design as we implement. We design as we implement. And that's why uh, from 2010, we had uh, this thing being implemented together. Uh, now let's see the magnitude of the informality. And you can appreciate why this program was established. Um, uh, the magnitude of informality in terms of percentage is around 90% of the assets in Tanzania are informal. And the value of the assets which are in the informal uh, business and informal uh, land is about 29.3 billion US dollars. You can just imagine, 29.3 billion US dollars. And where, uh, where is the break breakdown of this? On urban land, uh, it was uh, um, noted that uh, about 1,447,000 plots were not registered. 
and this was 89% of the entire urban land in the country. While the rural land, it was about 6,600,000 hectares of land not registered, and this is 94% of the land. Now you can imagine, and in terms of, uh, in terms of value, um, both urban and rural land, the value is 26.4 uh, US dollars billion. So you can imagine uh, if you are a sensitive uh, leader, if you are a responsible leader, you'll have to sit down and say, let us do something uh, on this. In terms of business, uh, although not the focus of this uh, uh, presentation, but it's worth knowing it, uh, about 4.5 million businesses, which is 80% of all businesses, were informal. So again, something had to be done about uh, business um, which are informed. What's the reason? Why, why is this situation? Is it that the government doesn't know the meaning? Is it that the people who are owning or are living in the informal sector don't know the value of it? But it was discovered during the diagnosis that uh, because the laws and regulations which are governing uh, formalization, both in terms of land and in terms of uh, businesses, we are very cumbersome, uh, we are uh, not user friendly, it took a long time to implement. So people said, why, why should you bother? If they are cumbersome, if they are so bureaucratic, why should we bother? We continue transacting our land businesses, transacting our business transaction informally, so long as life continues. So, at the, I mean, as a result, we are two parallel systems. We have the system which is formal, which, have, which is having very few people who comply, very few, along with the informal line, which have a lot of people. Almost all Tanzanians are in this line of uh, informal uh, transactions. So. The reason have been known, and after that said, okay, something had to be, have to be done, and the government now uh, approved that you have to go to the next phase, that the second phase. We have to design reforms which will take care of all the obstacles which have been noted during the diagnosis phase. Now, uh, because of, uh, of time, you can go to the website and see exactly how the process of, uh, of reform design was done. But for here, I'll just share with you the reform design framework. And the reform design framework has five major areas. And one area are the reforms which are related to uh, real estate property formalization. Because it is cumbersome, now we, we prepare reforms which are making uh, the process friendly and not cumbersome and more economic. And we have another, another uh, block that are reforms uh, for, for allowing economic use of real estate assets. As I said, that we, we make sure that people use the assets to make money. Now we created specific reforms that will make uh, uh, the ability of people to use these assets to make more money, to make more uh, growth of the uh, economy. Uh, the other two, two blocks is for business, and uh, one is for business formalization, and another one is for business growth. Because uh, we usually say many people are just doing business th that is for hand to mouth. We don't want hand to mouth businesses. We want to, uh, businesses which are growing. So we had to have specific reforms that uh, allow businesses to grow. And the, the final block, the final uh, area is reforms which are cross cutting. They are neither business, there are no, 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 no land issues, but they are very important if you want the economy to, to move forward. Um, now we have seen the magnitude of the problem. And what do we do now? And uh, this Mkurabita thing, I've got very few people, and the uh, country is very big. What do we do? So that's when uh, the program management unit chose to use this initiative which I'm sharing with you, the capacity building approach to the local government authorities. And the reason was to make the local government authorities own the process, make the local government authorities accept the, the process, accept, and have committed um, commitment to the process, be able to finance and own uh, the process so that everything is being done within the local uh, uh, government uh, authorities areas. And all the three areas, as I said, the rural land, the urban land, and the businesses, we undertook capacity building approach to implement it. But for today, uh, my focus will be uh, capacity building approach for rural land uh, formalization. Um, how did we do it? Is uh, The capacity building itself is training. But the training was... Uh, Theoretical training and practical training. And the theoretical training was very important because we wanted to train trainers who will also train other people to undertake the process. And we had three levels in doing this. One level was at uh, district council level. And so the district council, council level is like their trainers. They are training at the world level and the, the village level. So uh, after we, are, we were through with the 
participatory land use management team at the, the um, uh, district council level. We went down to the ward executive level where we, 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 we have trained the ward extension officers in the areas of agriculture, community development, education, forest, and health. All those uh, together with the team from the, the district, they went down to the village. So in the village level, we had uh, uh, village functionaries trained, uh, whom include the chairman, the village executive officer, the village land use planning team, the village education team, all these people are in the land law. So after we were convinced that this team are trained enough, now we, were, we went together to the field, and now comes the area of uh, practical training. And in the practical training, um, the district council was given the mandate to select the villages where the practical training can be uh, implemented. So it's two or three villages, and the activity which are being undertaken in the, the practical training is preparing land use plans, uh, undertaking adjudication, undertaking the survey, and finally, of course, giving uh, the, uh, the certificate of customer right of occupancy, the CCROs. Um, Again, when we were undertaking the uh, uh, practical training, we also prepared a uh, district's formalization plan because the, the intention is to, to leave the capacity to the district so that when we are through, they continue. So we said, okay, let's prepare the plan together. So we left the plan. Imagine we were doing it in two or three villages, but the district council had more than 100 villages. So we need to have a plan so that they can use it either to generate funds or to, to, I mean, to access funds from donors or, or from their own source, when they, they have funds, they, they can continue with implementing uh, what they're supposed to be implementing. Along with the plan, we also uh, constructed village land registries in some areas. Because existing I mean, uh, availability of village land registries is a, a legal requirement. If you, you formalize a rural land, you must have a register at, a, a registry at a village level and register at a uh, district level. And we had no problem with the district level because at least the situation was, uh, you know, um, um, appealing. But if you go to the, the, the village, the situation was very, very bad. So in the areas where we found no registries, we had to construct. In the areas where we found there were some registries, but in a very pathetic situation, we had to undertake very uh, serious and major renovation so, so, so that we have the registry in place. And again, um, while doing this, we have provided uh, survey gears, and uh, these gears include the GPS. We have 10 GPS for each uh, district council, two computers, one printer, cameras, laminating machines, land registry for, for districts, land registry for, for villages. All these things were given to the, to the district council so that after they are through with these two villages, they can just continue to another village. Again, the objective is to make sure that all these things, after Mkurabita has gone, they can continue and uh, uh, come up with a, a formalization agenda implemented. Now, uh, in the course of doing, building capacity, the results was that uh, we had uh, uh, surveyed 110,000 uh, farms in 280 villages, and over 96,000 uh, certificates of customer right of occupancy were prepared and issued to the owners. And the training uh, in, it was done in 53 district councils, uh, while also because we wanted people to, to, to use this uh, land uh, economically, we also trained the owners uh, of formalized land so that they can use to generate capital. But uh, one thing which we, we can be proud of, out of the areas which we visited and implemented this thing, uh, about 24 uh, 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 district councils managed to start doing it on themselves. So they managed to go through 226 villages and uh, surveyed about 17.7 uh, farms. Now you, you, you will wonder that uh, Mkurabita uh, did for 208 villages with 110,000, but the district councils went to 226 villages, but uh, only 17,000. It's because Mkurabita was doing systematic education, while the district councils are doing uh, sport education. So you can see the reason uh, why. Um, again, as a result of building capacity approach, we managed to reduce land conflicts between farmers and uh, farmers and farmers, farmers and cattle keepers, and village and village. I think you know about these things. We also reduced the bureaucracy. Uh, we simplified the process of doing it. 
Instead of being cumbersome, like we saw during the diagnosis, the WHO became simple, user-friendly, economical, and so at the end of the day, the local ownership which we wanted was, uh, was achieved, and hence the sustainability of the agenda uh, could be implemented at, uh, at the local government authority level. Um, yeah, um, sorry. Yeah, as a result of this, um, many people, many and farmers who were, were trained managed to, to access loans to the tune of about 202 million U, US dollars. And uh, not only that, farmers started to join pension funds for their benefits uh, during their old age. Now let's look at the challenges. Um, we have a lot of challenges, but I'll share with you all these uh, four challenges. One of, the, one of the, it is the lack of adequate financial resources to undertake formalization, but another serious one is lack of finance to undertake study. Um, Mkurabita started implementing uh, this thing in 2008. It's now close to 10 years, but if you ask me how much we have reduced the informality, I cannot tell you because the agenda is being implemented by a lot of people. Uh, there are USID doing it, you have Box Farm doing it, you have the ministries doing it. So a lot of people are doing it. Now, if you ask me as a person who is given this mandate, I cannot tell you until I do some, some studies. So uh, one of the things which, uh, if I can get any assistance from here, that we, we look some money, look some money which we want to undertake this study so that I can stand firm and say, this is the way how we have reduced the informality in the country. And we need about 745,000 US dollars to undertake this study so that we have it from the region level, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, what uh, statistics. And um, conclusively, I can say these uh, are four points, that uh, the program is purposely placed under the president's office uh, because of its importance. And not only that, the program is also in the uh, ruling um, uh, party manifesto, so it is very important. And uh, because the ultimate objective is to see Tanzanians running the economy themselves. And um, our five, uh, fifth government is uh, focusing on industrialization. So we want people on, through their lands they own, through their businesses they are, they are operating, they are able now to participate in industrializing uh, the country. And now we are in the process of doing this study. And once again, I call upon those who can be with me uh, to get the money for doing this particular study. Thank you very much for listening, and here is the website where you can get all the information, and here is my email, you can come back to me, and my uh, mobile telephone number is also here. Thank you very much for listening.